Welcome to Second Deck, the show that takes a look at the issues of animals. Environment Minister Barbara Creasy has released a draft of South Africa's updated nationally determined contributions for tackling climate change. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss the document and how it fits into the upcoming COP26 climate talk scheduled for Glasgow, Scotland in November. Hi, Terence. Hi, Chanel. What is a nationally determined contribution? Basically, uh, Chanel, it's a pledge that countries make uh, to the United Nations Con Framework Convention on Climate Change. And we know, for instance, there's been some famous conferences, the most famous being the Paris Agreement. And uh, that's where countries make their pledge to begin cutting their emissions and also adapting to climate change and also making commitments to support other countries to make, to make that transition away from fossil fuels towards maybe renewable in energy, for instance, but basically to build more climate resilient economies. So these are key uh, legal instruments or mechanism for ensuring that pledges are made and commitments are kept. What is included in this updated NDC? Well, South Africa in pre preparations for the, the Glasgow COP, COP26 uh, in November this year, uh, al along with all the other countries that are signatories are needing to make new commitments. And this time, I think the, the headlines of what is included in the South African draft updated pledge, this is not finalized. This is just a draft that uh, cabinet has allowed the environment minister, Barbara Creasy to release. Uh, for public consultation, but the headlines of that are really a, an accelerated uh, uh, um, reduction in South Africa's greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but then balanced with a sort of a demand almost for higher levels of climate finance to help South Africa transition to a low, lower carbon economy. So we made commitments back in October 2015 ahead of Paris where we said we had cut our greenhouse gas emissions to a certain level within a certain range by 2025 and with, to a certain level within a range again uh, by 2030. And those have revised by 17% better for, uh, for the uh, 2025 uh, time period and then by 28% better from fairly high levels because you know we are a carbon intensive economy, we're highly dependent on coal. So we had a, uh, we're looking at six, uh, a previous upper level of 614 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent units. And now we're looking at a range in the first phase where the upper levels around 510 mega, uh, million tons. And uh, in the second by 2030, at an upper level of 440 million tons. So it is a significant contribution, but it's still within a range so the, uh, we haven't lowered so much the, the lower level, but we've given ourselves a lower cap. And then on the other side, we're looking for accelerated climate finance, very much to support this transition. Climate finance is a key target for South Africa ahead of COP26. Yes, that's correct. We keep highlighting this issue. It is one of the commitments made uh, under Article 9 of the Paris Agreement that allows, uh, that basically says that developing countries or poorer countries should be supported by richer countries or developed countries in their transitions to uh, carbon resilience or lower carbon economies uh, to climate resilience economies. And if uh, those investments are, are needed to be made uh, to reduce carbon emissions and to transition more quickly, for instance, out of coal and into renewable energy, or to support uh, adaptation in the areas of human settlements or agriculture, for instance, that some of that um, money needs to flow from multilateral institutions in developed or industrialized countries to developing economies. And we're quite firm on that. At, at the moment, South Africa between 2018 and 2019 received over $4 billion worth of climate finance, mostly in the form of loans and mostly for mitigation. So what we're saying in our nationally proposed uh, nationally uh, defined contribution, determined contribution, is that we want that to be upscaled quite radically so that by 2030, we were getting up to $8 billion a year worth of climate finance into our system, 
to help us mitigate in the form of moving away from coal and to lower the emissions by going into renewable energy, for instance, but also a greater balance, not only between loan finance and maybe some more grant finance, but a greater balance between mitigation expenditure and also adaptation, which is going to be necessary, given that we aren't going to stop uh, global warming entirely, uh, even though there's major pledges being made. We are now sort of on a pathway to try and keep it under two, uh, the rise from pre-industrial levels to below two degrees Celsius. And uh, the ambition now is uh, post Paris to try to get that to uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. But there's still going to be negative effects from climate change. We're really seeing that around the world. Some of the adverse weather events, more intense, the fires and the, the, the difficult hurricane conditions, for instance. So uh, these, there's going to be a need to adapt to that. So a lot of the expenditure, more balance between mitigation and adaptation expenditure as we try and unlock this climate finance. South Africa is not yet ready to make a net zero emissions pledge though. Yes, I think there's going to be some disappointment around the level of ambition, even in these more ambitious uh, targets or pledges that we're making in this draft plan. Because I think what we're seeing around us is many, especially industrialized countries are making pledges to be net zero by 2050. Even China, which is a fast growing economy and has got a lot of coal in its system and has built a lot of new coal, is talking about a net zero economy by 2060. Whereas uh, I think it's quite clear from our pledge that we're not uh, really on that net zero pathway. And uh, I think there is going to be criticism of that, but the minister, Barbara Creasy, made it clear that we can't be aspirational with these pledges. These are something that we have to be able to finance and implement. And this is what we think we can finance and implement in the time frame from now until 2030. And it does put us on a, a lower carbon trajectory, but not definitely not to a net zero type level. But we know that Eskom, the, our major utility and our biggest uh, uh, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, has already made its aspiration known that it would like to move to a net zero position by 2050, which is a tall order given where we currently are. I mean, we've been, still been building new coal, never mind decommissioning old coal, but there will be a rapid decommissioning of coal-fired power stations between now and 2030 and an, ex, and an even ex, more accelerated pace of decommissioning post 2030. So really by that 2050 level, we will probably be living with Madupi and Cosilia and possibly any new coal that now enters the system, as well as this new gas that's entering the system, uh, unless we are able to find a way to exit that even quicker. But at this stage, under our current policy of the Integrated Resource Plan 2019 for Electricity, our current transport and energy efficiency strategies, we're not yet uh, ready to make a net zero commitment by 2050. What happens now? What happens now is that uh, this document has been approved for public consultation. It has been formally released to the public. Uh, there will be stakeholder engagements, uh, both at a provincial and a national level over the next couple of months till the end of May. Uh, but written comments need to be submitted by the end of uh, April. These then need to be digested by the department and integrated into the, a reformulated document. Uh, once that uh, new document is finalized, it will be represented to cabinet for its approval, and then it will be lodged formally uh, with the United Nations uh, before COP26 so that it can be synthesized into its report once that meets, so that uh, it's there and ready for when that meeting starts in November. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.